All right, people, let's go ahead and get started. Everybody doing all right this morning? Yep, okay, good. All right, so we are officially moving into Unit 4. In Unit 4, we're starting off in the Gilded Age. So we're going to do this today, uh, then do some videos. Probably have a debate coming up soon, but this will give you all some background information. So make sure everybody is in this Nearpod, okay? Um. So now we're talking about the time directly after uh, Reconstruction and Civil War. So the country's trying to get itself back together. And remember this whole idea about gilded as far as money. Is everybody got me on that? Is everybody following me so far? You got to remember this idea is all about money. Um, you're taking Cornell notes <clears throat> on your worksheet. So make sure you guys have that filled out. I am collecting your sheets today. So you're getting graded on that. As well, you're getting graded on what you complete here in the Nearpod. So, Go ahead, let's go ahead and get started on this part. Go ahead and unpack the standards. We do this normally on your things to know, but your things to know is NCTLS for you to use on your own. Is that clear there? That's not due until like the 21st when we take our test. But go ahead and circle the verbs, underline the nouns. You'll be doing this in your Nearpod. So go ahead and take a moment to do that. And I'll be here waiting on you. Yes, it says circle the verb and underline the noun. And remember, if you have your cell phone, if you go left, right, you have a bigger canvas to work with. This is just saying like what we want to do with standard 11. You want to make sure you can explain the railroads and other industries, including steel and oil. What do you think is two things we use a lot? Is it steel or oil? Which one do you think is used more today? Oil. Oil is for everything. Gasoline, right? Our world literally would not run without oil. So that's a big one. But we forget steel because steel is in every home and every building too. So those are our two biggest ones. All right, about 40 seconds left. So now when the time runs out, whatever you've completed is going to show up on my end. So as long as you're in there, that's good. If you don't finish every last one, that's fine. But I always like for y'all to unpack your standards. That way you know what you should, you're, you're basically are reading what you should know by the time we get done. So when we finish standard 11, these are things you should make sure you know. Like I said, y'all gonna be rotating a lot, right? Right, y'all? Okay. All right, so thank you everybody for doing that. All right, so like I said, you all are doing Cornell Notes, so this is an example of how you do Cornell Notes. So you all have an average sheet. If you don't have that sheet, that's fine. If you got a piece of paper, but we all are turning these in today. So you will have your title of the Cornell Notes. What do you think the title is going to be? Nope. What's the topic we talk about today? Uh, the Gilded Day. So that's going to be your title. That's given for you. And then you're going to have any kind of keywords. So you basically going to make your into like a um, <clears throat> spray in half. You have lines. You can just draw a line right down. I gave you docs. That way you ain't got to worry about being perfect. You want to just do a squiggle lane? That's fine too. But everybody should be writing and you'll be on the computer. So you should constantly be thinking about that. On the left side, all you're going to do is do um, keywords or questions, right? And I'm, on each slide, I'm going to tell you exactly what the main topic is. That way you can write it down. And then on the right of that is where you put down any kind of quick notes, abbreviations, pictures for you know, my visual learners, or also any kind of key thoughts or takeaways that from what I am talking to you about. So today I'm actually going to give you all a modify lecture, but you will make sure you write your notes on the right, the keyword or topic on the left. Is everybody clear there? That's Cornell Notes. You good? And am I collecting this at the end of the class today? Yes, I am. Okay. All right. So the first thing you got to make sure you write down will be your essential question. 
or in this case, learning targets. So listen, because we're not writing the whole thing down. This is what you're writing down. Students will evaluate the influence of individuals, groups, and institutions on the broad expanse, expansion, excuse me, of American businesses. That's all you got to write. So this whole, these last three sentences, four sentences, you're not writing. You should be writing down right now in your paper. I mean, everybody should have some movement in their hand. Students will evaluate the influence of individuals, groups, and institutions on the broad expansion. I made a mistake there. Expansion of American businesses. That's what you should be right now, right? So go ahead and get that start writing that down on your sheet and then send your question. And because you have the technology, you got to write in front of you, you got to worry about looking at it on the board. So students will evaluate the influence of individuals, groups, and institutions on the broad, what did I change that word to next, y'all? Expansion of American businesses. That's where you stop. You stop at businesses and expanse, it's supposed to be expansion. And forgive me for that, but you know. Okay. So what we're talking about now is how everything we're working with right now as far as business gets started. Do I got me on that? So this is the foundation of American businesses. After the Civil War, well, the society we live in right now, as far as how we see economics and businesses, really got started and kind of, because again, Civil War was like that midpoint, right? Changed everything in American history, and now we're living in the aftermath of that. So we're going to talk about how this works. Y'all about to get a lot of game about how to make money. Is that clear there? Some of the smartest people I know knew how to make money. They just always, sometimes they did it the right way, sometimes they didn't. But make sure you guys know how this system works as far as how to make money. So again, students will evaluate the influence of individuals, groups, and institutions on the broad expansion of American businesses. That's all you need. Now, y'all do know y'all have computers and in, in tech in front of you, right? Now, if you use your computer, if you do, um, I got to do it. Windows Shift S, you can do a screenshot directly on the computer. And of course, on your phones, I'm pretty sure most of y'all know how to do that. If you don't, um, Google it. But you can do that, and the reason I like y'all having the technology because as I'm moving, you can go back and look at it, right? Now, here's the next thing I'm going to help you out with. I am recording this, and as long as it works out, I'm going to post this in CTLS for you to look at again, too, okay? Is that right, clear there? Because the alternative assignment I got for people not being here is a little bit more wordy, and you guys are getting an easier version. So let's keep going. So just know that if you miss something, take a screenshot of it, but I'm also recording for you all to go back and look at, okay? All right. So you already have this, so you don't have to worry about this. It's just like, um, it's just recording a note sheet, but I gave everybody one. So now if you have a computer, now I'll get this for you as well. If you want to type your stuff, you can, but I'm taking it up today. So just do it on paper. Is that clear there? But if you want to download this before you can have your own version of it, that's fine. Uh, but you have your own paper. We can keep working with that. Go ahead and rotate, y'all. So the movement will keep your blood flowing, help you be attentive. Because we're at that midpoint, we'll make sure your grades stay high or get higher. If you just go back and forth, you're still making your body move. All right, so this is going to be a quick video. We see we have a couple questions here, right? Did I got me on that? So um, when you see these questions, I'll let you know if you got to answer them or not. And if I say put NA, that means you get NA. That way you keep your um your participation number high, okay? All right, let's go, y'all. Yeah. We not making history. Nah, this this, this is gonna be introduced in the skill today. Yeah. Andrew Carnegie, Joe Pulitzer. Check it out, uh huh. OG, this up some time. Okay. Who's born? I don't even need a thing. I can kick it out the pella. Do what you want. I'm John D. Rockefeller. Bigger than your favorite rapper. I'm bigger than Jay Z. He named his record company after me. I'm that OG with more oil than the Valdez. Said it all. That's just one of my companies. I'm born to trust the yes, I did. Now I gobble up these Colonel Sinners like a chicken feed. 
All right, so in your notes, it say what John D. Rockefeller did. What did John D. Rockefeller do? Oh, yeah, that's it. Just put it on there. First person, you can, on your left side, you put John D. Rockefeller, and it literally equals who? What? Oil. That's all you got to put. Does everybody got me on that? Don't everybody put N-A, right? You put oil. You should put oil in the near pot. You also should put John D. Rockefeller on your paper and oil. That's it. Is everybody clear there? You'd be surprised how important it's going to be just to remember that. Does everybody got me on that? So everybody should just throw in oil real quick on the near pot, three, three letters, and then just put John D. Rockefeller in your piece of paper equals oil, okay? John, just put Rockefeller. Think about Rockefeller Records, a uh, company that Jay-Z used to um, rap on. And that's all I'm going to say about Jay-Z and that old company of his. All right, let's go. So your next person is going to be who? Who's your next person, people? Yes, J.P. Morgan. Has anybody ever heard of J.P. Morgan Chase? It's the same thing. So that's banking, right? Does everybody hear me on that? So J.P. Morgan equals what? Banking or banks. For this um, right here, everybody just put N-A. Right here, everybody put N-A. So in the near part, everybody put N-A. In your notes, you should have J.P. Morgan equals what again? Banking. So very easy up here. Everybody, you just got to put N-A. You still getting your credit. In your notes, you should have J.P. Morgan equals banking. Is everybody clear? All right, let's keep going. Banks are built in, towns are filled in. The trauma very hotter than most of these whack cats. I'm a real hustler, putting trains on rail tracks, kicking those real facts. Little homie, pay attention. The only one that used the law to bring me my position. All right, so who should be next? Energy, Andrew Carnegie. Okay. Now, if you mess up the spelling, these are your notes, right? I'm not going to kill you on that. Do the best you can, but now you have Andrew Carnegie. And we're going to learn a little bit about him, too. Andrew Carnegie is going to equal something. So will Carnegie equal? Steel. Yes, thank you. Carnegie equals steel. So, so far, oil, which we use a lot, right? And steel, which we use a lot. <laughs> and banks, we use a lot. Is everybody got me on that? This is the basis of all these things that we use still to this day. Okay. We have a whole monopoly, like a ratio algebra, home rags, the riches I used to have, no dough. Now my paper vicious, so still Darwinism, yeah, I can't be stopped, like that metal laughter and pop them. All right, some more vocabulary words. Monopoly. We add these to your notes too. Monopoly. What is a monopoly? Monopoly. We're going to play the game, hopefully. Hopefully everything goes good. We'll be playing Monopoly on Monday. Hopefully everything goes good. What is a monopoly? It's money, but what else? You have control of everything, right? Like, so let's say William wants to control, um, and I have to go to him for my hair products for my braids, right? If William owns every last hair product line in the United States, he has a monopoly. Monopolies are bad because if it's a monopoly, William gets to decide on how much he wants to sell, and we got no choice. Do I got me on that? If he says all his hair products will cost $100, Either you spend $100 or you get no hair products. Make sense on that one? Is everybody clear on that? Best way to explain it, you have in the Southeast, we have Publix and we have Kroger, right, y'all? Did you ever notice that their prices are never exactly the same? Does anyone ever notice that? You notice that typically one will have sales on something, the other one have sales on something else, right? That's the exact opposite of a monopoly. Is everybody clear there? Now, if every grocery store was called Kroger, Kroger can sell whatever they want at any price they want because they you only can go to them for that product. Is that clear there? So monopolies can be a bad thing. Now, the other one is going to be social Darwinism. Social Darwinism. Your next topic will be social Darwinism. Now, y'all should have learned this in a couple different places, but anyone don't know what Darwinism is? I'm going with what you said, but survival of the fittest, right? So Darwinism has to do with the idea of survival of the fitness. Fit, um, 
survival of the fittest, meaning only the strong will be able to survive, right? So that means if you're weak, you get preyed on, you're not going to survive. Is that clear there? Now you throw that in social, we talk about society, right? That means who has money, who has education, who has the car, who has means of uh, transportation. Do I got me on that? So now this idea of social dominance is getting the idea that only the strong is going to survive in this new um, American society. Does that make sense? If you have a weakness, you're not going to do so good. If you're poor, you might not do so well. Do I got me on that? And let's keep in mind, are, are, do women have rights yet? No. So again, social work Darwin, Darwinism. Is everybody good to be on that one? We good so far? Yeah? Okay, let's keep going. We had JP Morgan on there, right? Okay, so we go a little bit more detail on him. Your whole house is smaller than my fish tank, making bank. But Congress wasn't giving me thanks. Uh, we're the fat cats with the bad rap, so they hit us with the Sherman anti. All right, go ahead and take a note of that Sherman Antitrust Act. I'm gonna talk about this later in today's lecture, but just make a note of uh, Sherman Antitrust Act, and then we'll talk about it a little bit, okay? Let me reiterate, this is that one unit that everything we talk about affects us right now. Do I got me on that? We're going to talk about stocks, we're going to talk about bonds, we're going to talk about money. We're going to talk about everything that affects your bottom line right now. All right, let's get it. Antitrust Act. I'm going to come back to it, okay? Antitrust Act to break up the monopoly. Well, that just said it. <laughs> To break up the what? What did the Antitrust Act do? Break up monopoly. So remember I just told you how monopolies are bad, right? So imagine this is what's going on this time period. You had one person controlling everything. So you had one person controlling all the oil. I mean, they set the price for it. One person controlling all the steel. I mean, they set the price for it. If I am a entrepreneur, I want to make the most money as I can. Is that what I got me on that? And I understand that. Me, my goal is to make money. I am not trying to help out you as a consumer. Is that right clear there? So I need to make as much as I can. So if I can own everything, I'm making more money. But because of the Antitrust Act, monopolies are now illegal. Is that clear there? If we didn't have the Antitrust Act and no one ever talks about it, we wouldn't have a monopoly. So everybody knows what Foot Locker is, right? Did you know Foot Locker is Foot Locker, Kids Foot Locker, Lady Foot Locker, Champs, Foot Action, and East Bay? Is that a lot? Foot Locker is very close to Monopoly because you know if you go to the mall, those are the main places you see, right? The only thing that's kind of stopping that Monopoly is two companies, Finish Line and Athlete's Foot. <laughs> is there a got me on that? And I am so surprised Athlete's Foot ain't been bought out yet. Is there a follow me? But if, you t if Foot Locker was to own those two, it would be a Monopoly, right? Which would be illegal, which is why those two companies are always going to be safe. Like Finish Line, most likely would never go, one of them two would never go out of business for the simple fact of the Antitrust Act. Now imagine if Foot Locker owned everybody. You think how, you think shoes are expensive now? If they can set the price, guess what's gonna happen then? Y'all follow me now? Now it's just click, right? Okay, let's keep going. All right, everybody put NA right here. Everybody put NA right here. You put this in your notes. Everybody go ahead and quickly put in NA. All right, let's go. But when they need to go, that's when they crawl to me. Can't talk, that's the lazy fair economy. Weak regulators, they can't bother me. I'm Joe Pulitzer, I'm 10 on a Richter. I'm how they set the standard for all prize winners. U.S. go to war, I use news to divide us. In Cuba, Teddy Roosevelt screaming. Riders. Tell me who's in control of your worldview. The man with paper in hand, Pulitzer's the truth. I don't need no facts. This is yellow journalism. Exaggerate. 
All right, so go ahead and make a note of yellow journalism. Everybody can put NA here. Yellow journalism equals, huh? It's something you hear a lot. It starts with an F and the other word is an N. Fake, fake news, okay? Yellow journalism equals fake news. And what fake news is is always, you know, exacerbated news, trying to get people to like, get likes, clicks, or read the newspapers. Everybody got me on that? Everybody hear me on that? So that means you kind of look at the truth and you extend it a little bit just to get you to get there, right? To get you to read it or in today's modern time with social media, to get you to get that like button or just to look at it. You get paid just all the likes and looks. Does everybody got me on that? So yellow journalism equals what? Fake news, which is just, again, fake news. It's like, it can have some truth to it, but you just kind of extend it a little bit more to get people to read it. Everybody with me? What's your question? Are you good? You right now. All right, let's keep going. Everybody got the NA? Let's go. Exaggerate the truth. Sensationalism. Fuck up the lady shirt. To the caviar. I don't need a car. I run on real jet. Keep the fight inside the way to slow. So the back is the labor. No, who we control. I own 90% of all. Keep it greasy. These machine politics get it kind of sleazy. Me and Ross Tweed. Yeah, we own the boat. Tammany Hall player. Yeah, that ain't no joke. All right, go ahead and rotate. Kai. All right, so this is gonna be the crash course for the Gilded Age. I'm gonna give John Green a break, especially because I'm looking at our time, but I would suggest definitely go back and look at this and you find yourself having any kind of issues with the Gilded Age. All right, clear there? And we're covering for the next couple of days, but use this as a way to review. All right, first let's get into the introduction. Now, let's talk about what the idea of Gilded Age came from, and I'm gonna get some people to read. Just read one paragraph that calls somebody else. Write your own notes if you feel is needed, okay, everybody? All right. First up is going to be Taylor. Can you just read the first paragraph and then you can, I'm going to go to somebody else? and the turn of the century, about 1887 to 1900. It was a time of un unprecedented. unprecedented and tumultuous. All right, so my notes, well, I would say, what is the Gilded Age? Everybody got me on that? Does everybody hear me on that? What is the Gilded Age? Who created this name, the Gilded Age? Mark Twain, in what year? 1873. That's it. <laughs> Is it clear there? What was the Gilded Age? Created by Mark Twain, 1873. And I would say it was a time of economic growth, bad politics, and immigration. Is that clear? I just told you exactly what to write. So what is the Gilded Age? So far, we got 1837. Um, Coined by Mark Twain, it was a time of economic growth, bad politics, and immigration. Is everybody clear there? 
If you hear me clap once. Okay. You can call somebody for the second paragraph. All right, Jonathan, can you read the next paragraph? And I'm going to stop because it's kind of long. All right, so now I'll also put in there lazy fair, okay? It spells just like it is on the board L A S S I E Z dash fair F A I R E equals little government intervention, like little government. So, in other words, Think about this. When we at home, when we had with our parents, this is when our parents was totally leave us alone. Does everybody got me on that? Does everybody follow me on that? At the start of Gilded Age, you had a lot of lazy, fair politics, meaning government wasn't really trying to do nothing. Again, think about it. We just finished the Civil War, right? Most people did not want the government to be involved anyway. Everybody clear there? Y'all good? All right. Then the three main themes of the Gilded Age can be summed up as this. Lazy, and then I'll put this in my notes. Lazy fair versus government, economic and politic, political corruption. Because maybe we talk about back politics, right? So economic and political corruption, and also modern political and economic norms. So this again, this is the basis of what we have right now. Is that got me on that? Because of these bad economic and po political situations, because of lazy fair government, now we have what it forces us to develop what we now have as modern economic and political norms. Does everybody got me on that? Does I follow? So the way we, now let me say this, I'm gonna give y'all some US government. Politics equals the why, like why things are being done. Is everybody clear there? Government is the who, the what, the when, the where. Does everybody follow me so far? So politics is the why, like why do we have this law? Why was this law passed? Why was this done? So when we got similar checks, there's a reason why. Bad economy. Does everybody got me on that? We still got a bad economy, but we can't just keep giving people stimulus checks for the simple fact the way the government sees is that if we keep giving you money, you're not going to go back to work. And we already saw that problem. We all remember that problem, right? A lot of people was not working. People were making more money off of getting stimulus checks and unemployment than they were actually going to work, which then goes to an the idea, maybe we need to look at this idea of minimum wage, right? So this is all talk about modern politics. Everybody follow me so far? Y'all with me? All right. Any questions so far? Excellent. All right. Answer the question. This should be a pretty easy one. The three main themes of the Gilded Age can be summarized as what? A or B? You do obviously doing this in the near pod, right? Hmm? Hit the refresh button. All right, so we got about, most of y'all all right. What is the correct answer here? Oh, we got everybody answered. Good, good job, y'all. What is the correct answer? B, yes. All right. And it's literally just copy and paste what I told you to write, right? All right. So we get so far with the basics of the Gilded Age. All right, now what I'm going to go more in detail, okay? And then, so again, please make sure you hear me. My goal is for we have a whole class, or at least an hour, of playing Monopoly on Monday for review. Is that clear there? And the goal for Monopoly is for y'all to really see how this stuff works. So some of y'all gonna be skilled workers. Some of y'all be unskilled workers. Some of y'all be government. Is everybody got me on that? And you're gonna see how that works as far as money. Yeah, I wanna make sure you guys understand as y'all matriculate, if you have a skill, you always gonna be good. If you are unskilled, meaning you really don't have nothing to do, and they're going to be so good for you. And the monopoly, I think y'all be able to see it, okay? All right. Now, political machines, um, good idea. Well, actually, I'll do probably take a screenshot of this real quick. I'm not going to really add this into the uh, your notes, only because this is more for my honors AP students. Is that clear there? Honors AP students, yes, you need to make sure you understand 
these political machines and like how things are working. But for y'all, we're gonna just keep pushing, okay? All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me go back. I need everybody to go ahead and type in NA, okay? I'm gonna keep your scores up. Everybody type in NA. And of course, if this was my honors AP students. They will actually be doing this, okay? So right now I'm talking about my college prep students. Y'all are good. Everybody type in NA to keep your scores high and we keep moving. All right, let's go. All right, now let's talk about the elections. So now that'll be your next topic. Is everybody got me on that in your Cornell notes? The elections of the Gilded Age. Is everybody with me? I hate lecturing, so is this is this y'all following me so far? Okay, and y'all gonna move in a little bit. But we got some elections. What does popular vote in these elections say about the nature of the United States politics in the Gilded Age? So we talk about the popular vote. So we got the election of 1800. We got the election of 1884. So I'm telling you what questions to put in your, your uh, Cornell notes. Did I got me on that? We go to the first one. What does the popular vote in these elections say about the nature of the United States politics in the Gilded, Gilded Age? Fez, what do you think, Mike? So we answered this question right at the top question. What does the popular vote in these elections say about the nature of the U.S. politics of the Gilded Age? You said Garfield what? He had more vote than that. Okay, now is it more than the north or the south? Okay, now go look at what's going on in 1884. Is it the same thing? Is it still pretty? I don't want to say it. <laughs> is anyone else seeing it too? If you look at the map, it's kind of like anybody else seeing it? What what you see? So on, on 1880, if you look here, it's kind of split between North and South. Yeah, so now on 1884, post-Civil War, right, you have a little bit more of a mixing. Not that much, but it's a little bit more. Does everybody got me on that? That's something you can say about popular vote. Now, what does the pattern of electoral vote say about the nation's unity after the Civil War? All right, now. Let's go back to um, this idea of electoral vote. Remember, based on the Constitution, who votes for the president, us or the Electoral College? I thank you all. I'm sure I've been hitting that a lot. Yes, the Electoral College votes for it. So if we look at this. What does the pattern of the electoral say? So now, if you notice here, Electoral College, 214, 155, 219, uh, 182. You see a switch, Democrat and Republican. Is everybody clear there? Did I follow me on that? Remember, at this time period, Republicans are typically your Northerners. They will sometimes be seen as your anti-slave. Everybody got me on that? Your Democrats will be your plantation owners, which would be very much pro-slavery. Did I follow me there? So if you have to look at this, and again, we got to make sure we always constantly remember this because I can throw this kind of stuff on the test, right? About how to analyze it. Um, before the war, Republicans had a very strong turnout. After the war, Democrats had a lot more stronger turnout. Does everybody got me on that? Which means the South gained a little bit more power. Is everybody clear there? And you remember the re one reason why you look at Reconstruction, they wanted the South to come back, right? Is everybody got me on that? Say, hey, we forgive you, but just come back. We got to get this country back together. Is everybody follow me on that? You also have something else that's going on, too. The Northerns were kind of tired of this idea of the Civil War. Is everybody got me on that? They were tired. It's like, look. This is over with. It's affecting my money, too. Let's just get it done. Let's just move on with our day. Everybody clear there? All right, one more question we got to answer, right? In these elections, Republicans promoted tariffs and the Democrats opposed them. What's a tariff? Y'all should know this because we're dealing with them right now. Huh? Tax on imported goods. A tariff is a tax on imported goods. So Republicans promoted that, right? The South, do you think they're going to be very happy with that? No. And remember, the South are what? Are they Republicans or Democrats? Democrats. Remember, South is Democrats. Southern Democrats. Yeah, we just we just said that answer too. 
All right, so make sure everybody has that in. Guess what's going to be time to do, y'all? Rotate. Yep, get on up and rotate. Let's go. Get on up and rotate. So it'll be very hard to fall asleep and not be noticed today. I mean, I notice it every day, but now it's going to be just like, yeah, you really just not doing it. So remember these ideas of charts and graphs because this is a big thing that comes up on your test. Move this one. Thank you. Get some more room. Very good, very good. All right, if you're good so far, clap once. All right, if you can hear me good, clap twice. Okay, let's keep going. All right, everybody put NA here because we just did this. So y'all should have 100 in the near pod, right? Right? Yeah. Everybody can go ahead and put the NA down. All right, I'm ready to move on. All right, let's go. Uh, here I put NA here again, too. Because we just answered all these questions, right? You, have, you should have these in your Cornello, so that's what I'm going to look for them at. All right, let's go. All right, James Garfield. Everybody should listen to me real quick. James Garfield. He was president, so you should add this to your notes, did you not? James Garfield, he was president. And he was shot. Did I clear there? James Garfield was the president of the United States, and he was shot, which is being depicted in this um, picture, okay? So on July 2nd, 1881, James Garfield was the first president in United States history to be assassinated. Is that right? Got me on that. Oh, I'm sorry. Second. Yeah, Lincoln was assassinated too. I'm sorry. All right. All right, so... James Garfield was the second president to be assassinated. Now, because of his assassination, the Civil Service Reform Act was passed. Because of his assassination, the Civil Service Reform Act was passed. And again, that's in your near pods. Make sure you guys write in your notes. which made the United States a bureaucracy. I hope y'all remember this, we take uh, American government too. The Civil Service Reform Act made the United States a bureaucracy. Okay. So y'all write and give y'all a second. I'll say what well, bureaucracy is in layman's terms in a minute. And what that means is that, is everybody hear me on this? Bureaucracy means that the decisions are made by the state governments over the federal government. Is everybody clear there? Is everybody right with me so far on that? Most important decisions are made by the state rather than their elected representatives in Congress. And I'm going to tell you why you should care about that, because it's something that happened over the last summer. This is 2022, the summer of 2022. 
So then, somebody tell me, what's the bureaucracy again? Important decisions made by the state instead of their elected representatives. So, the United States Supreme Court overruled in the Dobbs, in the, I forgot the name of the um, court case. They overruled Roe v. Wade, which is abortion. Is that right, got me on that? And they sent it back to the states. It's an example of this, right? They're saying the most important decision to be made by the state. The rationale is that we're more affected by the states than we are the federal government. Is that right, clear there? We live in the state of Georgia, right? Georgia laws are going to affect us like that immediately, whereas federals will take some time. Here's an example. During COVID, Georgia was locked down for like a week or two. Like a week or two. Is that right, clear there? And then we opened right back up. <laughs> federal government was still in the lockdown, still mask mandate, everything else. Is that right, got me on that? So that's an example how the state laws always will be more quickly influenced than federal. Is everybody clear there? So now you know bureaucracies. Again, this is also help y'all for American government because all this will come right back up. Everybody with me? All right. Good job, y'all. All right, um, NA. And this is being, because I'm, again, I'm hoping I see all this in your Cornell notes, right, y'all? Y'all got to back to this. If you need to have more paper, that's fine, too. Go ahead and throw your NAs here. All right, very good, young folks. Let's keep going. All right, Chester Arthur. So who just got assassinated? Uh, Garfield. Garfield. So now somebody getting assassinated, some guys step up, right? So that means Chester Arthur, who was the vice president, now becomes the president. All right. So Chester Arthur becomes president after the assassination of Garfield. He then allows all his friends or loyalists to become part of um, his cabinet. Is that right? I mean, all his political appointments were always his friends or people that were loyal to him. Is that right? Got me on that. You got me on that? Say yes, no? Yes. All right. Now, that's important because a lot of presidents do that. And if you try to trip out, well, guess what? Arthur did it too. This is back in 1881. You have more recent presidents over the last 10 to 15 years have done it too. Is that right? Got me on that? It's not a new thing. And I kind of get it. I kind of want to be close to people that was loyal to me and my friends, right? I can trust them more than someone maybe not. Here's the problem. I don't have a mixed room, meaning they don't probably yes men and women more than anything else. All right. Arthur pushed for lower tariffs, even though he was a Republican. Remember, Republicans were always pushing for higher tariffs. Everybody got me on that? But Arthur was like, no, it's lower those tariffs. Everybody with me so far on that. So again, you should have Arthur in your notes, and then I'm going to give you all background information. Now, why do you think he was trying to um, lower tariffs? Who was he trying to help with that? The South were also businesses, right? Everybody got me on that? Businesses like low tariffs. I'm not sure if y'all noticed, but our cell phones cost a lot more money because of those tariffs. You know what I'm saying? Like, my kids got old phones that we used to use because, you know what? I can't buy another one because I can't, but it costs too much money. Y'all, a cell phone not supposed to cost almost $2,000. Just make sure you clearly understand that it's not a good thing, okay? Go look at how much it makes to make that thing. It ain't $2,000 for no cell phone. All right? All right, are we good with Arthur? You good? Okay, keep going. All right, everybody put NA here because we already kind of answered all these questions. Guess what it's time to do, y'all? Rotate. Let's go. Go get my rotation on. 
And next up will be Grover Cleveland. Yeah, it's just a bit more on the cart. Get some more paper. You need another paper? Get it on the cart. You're going to staple them for me. That's fine. Let's go to Grover Cleveland now. All right. So Grover Cleveland. Jill, can you start reading for us, please? I'll tell you when to stop. All right, so what is that saying? So what did grow what did what 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 did you just say about Cleveland? What's the main idea there? What's going on with Cleveland? He supports single service. What you got? He tried to stop terrorists. Now, why was his rationale of stopping them? Like, what was his argument? Why do he see terrorists as being a bad thing? I'm asking anybody in the room. People are paying more than what they're supposed to pay, right? Like, why, again, why are we, got, you don't get a new cell phone. Now, granted, you don't trip because you ain't got to pay two grand at the rip, right? They say, I'm going to bill you over time, which means they're going to add interest to it. I'm not sure if y'all understand. Interest means you pay more than what the actual price is. Y'all with me so far? So why are we cool with that? Like, because again, the idea is that, well, here's how much it's going to cost, but I'm just going to charge $35 a month. Cleveland's like, you shouldn't be having to pay $35 a month because it shouldn't cost $2,000. Y'all with me so far on that? If it costs $1,000 to get the cell phone, hey, let's get us kill these tariffs where we don't, want, we don't have to be taxing so much. Is that follow me on that? So that's what he's saying. Like we pay, there's no point for everybody paying this much. Okay, people are struggling. Um, we talk about inflation right now, like 20, 2022. Everybody's talking about inflation, right? Have you had anybody? Have you heard anybody say anything about tariffs? Guess what? You set the tariffs, inflation might get helped. I said it might. It might not, but at least it'd be in the it'd be in the right direction. Is everybody got me on that? Is everybody with me? See the army. All right. So we got, that means we got a little idea of tariffs. All right, let's keep going. Good morning. Good morning. All right, everybody put NA here, so you good? Everybody go ahead and put NA here. All right, let's keep going. All right, um, we're not going to do nothing about Benjamin Harris. Um, this would be definitely more for my honors AP students. So we can kind of leave him. We're going to review him again. Everybody put NA here for me. <coughs> honors the AP students looking at the video can definitely go back in the video and kind of take a screenshot of him and add any notes to it. But for my college prep students, you're good. All right, everybody put NA here. All right, let's go. Sherman Antitrust Act. Remember, I was talking about that earlier, right? Now, we always said, what was the Sherman Antitrust Act? It stops what? Monopolies. That's all you need to know. Is that right clear there? This is more detail. We don't got to add anything here, do we? Because you already got this in your notes, true or false? All right, so what factors might have led to the federal courts 
to poorly enforce the Sherman Trust Act. What do you guys think may have led them? I think it's taking to read it. What do you guys think may have led the courts to not really enforce the Sherman Trust Act? I mean, you guys got to probably think about it already. Corruption. Corruption, yeah. That's it. Does everybody got that? Everybody hear them? So guess what you're supposed to write right now? <laughs> corruption. What is corruption, though? I don't want you to let that go. What is corruption? What does it mean to be corrupt? Infiltrator, disappear, what? Subject to outside interference, meaning you can't trust the person, right? So, yes, it was corrupt, so you couldn't really trust it. How can we enforce something when the system itself is corrupt? All right. Good, 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 good. All right. You got, all you got to type in is corruption, y'all. So you're not paying attention. You're about to get, not to get these coins. About to move on. All you got to type in is corruption. You should be having your own piece of paper out, taking notes. We're doing Cornell notes. If you need more paper, still some over on the card. All right, let's get rolling. All right, the battle over currency. All right. So what should be next in your notes, y'all? Battle over currency. All right, JV, can you start reading for us, and I'm gonna call somebody else. All right, so. So, Davion, in your own words, what 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 summarize what you just said? Okay, who was trying to purchase what? The government trying to purchase what? Silver. To make more money, yeah, to help inflation. So they're trying to buy. Things to make infl to help out with inflation, right? That's what he just said, right? So, so we know that there's a problem with money, right? Not everybody's doing very well right now, are they, y'all? We consistently talk about money, and then some people are shaking their heads like, yeah, everybody's not doing so great right now. All right. Now, however, as more silver was what? Mine. So, you know, silver comes from the ground, right, y'all? Okay. So, as more silver was mined, its value did what? Drop. Economics 101. You have to know this. Supply and demand. Okay? When y'all get the econ, it's going to be kind of difficult. I don't know, but I'm going to tell you simply this is the equation. If I have high supply, somebody want to help me, help me on this? Thing? You have high supply and what? Low what? Low demand. So there's a lot of it. Can't buy it because everybody can go get it, right? Do I got me on that? Now, now yeah, at this time here, we have so much silver, it's not worth as much. Does everybody follow me on that? Conversely, if I have low supply with high demand, what's going to happen to the price? It's going to go up. Retro Jordans, we all know what that is, yes? Is there a high supply of those? Okay, let's, let me, okay. Some yes, some no. Okay, I'll say Retro 11, all right? Is there a high supply of those? No, that's why they two hundred fifty dollars. They make a certain amount, and then either you get it or you're not. Is that got me on that? And guess what? Because you know there's not a lot of it, you are maybe more willing if you have the money to go spend that money on it. Is that clear there? All right. So remember, I told you this unit has a lot to do with things we deal with every day, right? Is everybody following me? Y'all still good? Okay. N A. Because y'all just wrote in your notes. Y'all, when I pick these notes up, I really hope they're good, okay? They should be good, right, y'all? Right. If you need more paper, there's some over on the card. All right, everybody threw that NA in for me. Appreciate you. Refresh it. If you got a white screen, sometimes Nearpods takes a second and come up for y'all, but just refresh it. And you be copacetic. All 
All right, let's keep going. Is everybody with me? Yep. Okay. You feel like you learned a little bit today? Yeah, good. All right. William Jennings, Brian, um, for us, we're not going to um, focus here on this guy. This would be more for my honors and AP again. Is everybody got me on that? So for college prep, you guys don't have to worry about that. I would never put him on your test. Honors and AP might be different, though. Okay, so y'all are good. Um, let's just go ahead and skip him. And what should I put here? And A, because not hackable. All right, throw it in real quick, y'all. We're rotating a couple minutes, okay? I put in A, everybody put in A. And A and A. All right, let's go. Let's go. Let's get it. William McKinley, we got to talk about bro right here, though. We got to talk about Kinley real quick, all right? William McKinley. Is everybody still with me? Okay. All right, William McKinley. I'm going to give you all a second kind of read at it real quick. He was the 25th president of the United States. Everybody got me on that? He was the 25th president of the United States. He was a Republican. Y'all with me? What's something big about McKinley? Basically, you read so far. He's focused on what? He's focused on what kind of silver issue? Silver issue. So you still talk about his money problem, right? All right. Anything else about him? Anything else how about with McKinley? All right, first of all, make sure you guys go ahead and put this down for McKinley. We went to war against Spain. So under William McKinley, we had the Spanish-American War. Is everybody got me on that? Is everybody with me? Write this down. Under McKinley, we had the Spanish-American War, and we got Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines out of the Spanish-American War. Everybody, know, everybody heard about Puerto Rico, right? This is when we acquired it. It's through McKinley's um, presidency in the Spanish-American War. Is everybody with me on that? So what war was McKinley uh, president during? And what did the United States gain as a result of that war? Now, we didn't get Cuba, but we became very close with Cuba. Does everybody got me on that? And the reason why that's a big deal, Cuba was a huge sugar export. Sugar is then going to come back to what, y'all? What do we do with sugar? Eat it. We use it for everything, right? And if you use it, that means you got to buy it. Is that right clear there? So that comes back to the, our economics. So make sure you got that down for McKinley. Go ahead and put N.A. here. All right, put N.A. there. Keep going. All right, rotate. Move anywhere you want. Just move, though. All right, very good, very good, very good. All right, let's keep going. Everybody put the NA there for that one. Video time, y'all. All right, so now, how many of y'all ever heard of the Wizard of Oz? 
Raise your hand if you ever heard of Wizard of Oz. All right. That's your next um, topic on your in your notes. Did and this is the question you're answering. Did the Wizard of Oz have some background underlining meaning? Okay. You, you can say yes, you can say why too. Okay. So the Wizard of Oz, did it have some underlying meaning? Okay. So let's watch and see what we got. Did the Wizard of Oz have some underlying meaning? In the summer of 1963, a high school teacher changed the way the world looked at the Wizard of Oz. His name was Henry Littlefield, and he was teaching an American history class. He'd made it to the late 19th century, a time called the Gilded Age. But he was struggling to keep his class interested in the complex social and economic issues of the time. Then one night, while he was reading the wonderful Wizard of Oz to his daughters, he had an idea. In the 1890s, farmers wanted to add silver to the gold standard to put more money in circulation and make it easier for farmers to borrow. In the book, Dorothy walked to the Emerald City on the Yellow Brick Road in her silver shoes. The movie's ruby red slippers started out as silver. Silver and gold on the road to prosperity. L. Frank Baum had published the book in 1900 at the height of the Gilded Age, and the analogy didn't seem out of the question. No one else had seen these connections, but that didn't deter Littlefield. He taught his class about the Gilded Age using the book, and soon he and his students were finding more connections. For instance, in the late 1890s, the U.S. had recently recovered from the Civil War and integrated vast new territories, bringing an era of prosperity for some. But while industry and finance in the North and East prospered, farmers across the South and Midwest struggled. This led to the populist movement, uniting farmers and workers against urban elites. By 1896, the movement had grown into the People's Party, and its support of Democrat William Jennings Bryan put him in reach of the presidency. Meanwhile, in Oz, claimed Littlefield, Dorothy is a typical American girl whose hard life in Kansas is literally turned upside down by powerful forces outside her control. The Munchkins are the common people oppressed by the Witch of the East, banks and monopolies. The Scarecrow is the farmer, considered naive, but actually quite resourceful. The Tin Woodman is the industrial worker, dehumanized by factory labor. And the Cowardly Lion is William Jennings Bryan, who could be an influential figure if only he were brave enough to adopt the populists' radical program. Together, they travel along a golden yellow road towards a grand city whose ruler's power turns out to be built on illusions. Littlefield published some of these observations in an essay. His claim that this fantasy was actually a subversive critique of American capitalism appealed to many people in the 1960s. Other scholars took up the theme, and the proposed analogies and connections multiplied. They suggested that Dorothy's dog Toto represented the teetotalers of the Prohibition Party. Oz was clearly the abbreviation for ounces, an important unit in the silver debate. The list goes on. By the 1980s, this understanding of the book was accepted so widely that several American history textbooks mentioned it in discussions of late 19th century politics. But is the theory right? L. Frank Baum's introduction claims the book is just an innocent children's story. Could he have been deliberately throwing people off the trail? And is it fair to second-guess him so many decades later? There's no definitive answer, which is part of why authorial intent is a complex, tangled, fun question to unravel. And some recent scholars have interpreted the wonderful Wizard of Oz in the opposite way as Littlefield. They claim it's a celebration of the new urban consumer culture. Historian William Leach argued that the dazzling Emerald City of Oz was meant to acclimate people to the shiny new America. In the end, all we know for sure is that Baum, inspired by European folk legends, had set out to create one for American children. And whether or not he intended any hidden meanings, its continuing relevance suggests he succeeded in creating a fairy tale America can call its own.
All right. So was there some hidden meaning? What was some of the hidden meaning behind the um, story of Wizard of Oz? Again, most kids have at least heard of it, right? Most of us watched it, maybe a couple, maybe one or two, maybe we read it. What was some of the hidden meaning, meaning of the Wizard of Oz? Yeah, Emerald City, Emerald City was a shiny new American post of a war, right? The characters were like people, right? Can those people still be just justified by today? Yeah, right? So if you look at The Wizard of Oz, all it was was a fictional story about what we got going on right now. Y'all follow me on that? Does everybody hear me? So it was very much, and typically most like pieces of art have some kind of truth to them, okay? All right. So y'all can go ahead and put NA here. Maybe I can go ahead and put A and A's here. So hopefully the Wizard of Oz kind of make what we've been talking about the last hour or so really kind of come together. All right, we're almost done. All right, put A. Actually, no, you need to do this part. All right, using any website, you need to add this to your notes. Everybody clear there? Somebody tell us. Go ahead and start looking up. Ask Siri, what was the AFL? And we're not talking about the football league. So let's, help, let's help each other out, okay? Everybody go ahead and get your beautiful phones out, and let's go ask Siri or ask Google, what was the AFL? Let's ask these questions together. What was the AFL? American Federation of Labor. So we should add that, right? So what was the AFL? American Federation of Labor. Who founded it? Samuel Gumpers. Samuel Gumpers founded it. So now, this was the first union. Does everybody got me on that? It was the first union meant to try to help, help protect laborers. Is everybody clear there? Guess what we all are as workers? Guess what we all are as workers, y'all? Laborers. Don't we need to have protections? Is everybody, is everybody following me? Don't we need to have protections as workers? Should our bosses be able to talk to us any kind of way? Should our bosses be able to treat us any kind of way? Aren't we, shouldn't we have a good working wage? These are things that we all complain about, but guess what we never asked for? A union. In case you did not notice, Georgia is a work at will state. Is that right with me so far on that? I don't care what your job is. If you come in and I just I just don't want to see you today, you're fired. Bye. You have absolutely no legal grounds for protection. Is that right? Got me on that. It's the exact opposite of what these guys are doing. Most and I'm not gonna say every union is great. There's a lot of bad things going to unions, a lot of corrupt unions too, but at the heart of a union is meant to try to help, help protect the uh, workers and give them a right and voice for fair wages. Is everybody got me on that? Is everybody got me? All right, y'all can go ahead and now put NA here. <clears throat> well, you're answering in your, uh, your notes. Answer in your notes. Now, if you put it here, that's fine. Take a screenshot of it, but I'll just put that in my notes. AFL stands for what again? American Federation of Labor. It was founded by who again, y'all? Samuel Gumpers. And um, why was it founded again? To help for, help what? Help what? Help protect who? Laborers. Talk about unions. Okay. It's a union to help protect laborers. All right. Okay, people. Covered a lot today, didn't we? Okay, covered a lot today. So, this is what's going to happen, okay? We're going to stop here for now. Do I got me on that? Now, there are two things that I need you to go look up. Is that I got me on that? Is that I have me on that? We're going to look at immigration now, okay? Look at immigration. All right, immigration. There were two forms of immigration. One was Angel Island, one was Ellis Island. Is there I got me on that? One was Angel Island, one was Ellis Island. 
okay? What I'm going to do is go ahead and play these two videos on both Angel and Ellis Island, and then we're 100% done. Does I got me on that? Is everybody clear there? And guess what? Y'all have now fully covered Standard 11 for the most part. I think it's like one thing I missed, but we covered Standard 11. We good? Okay. Now, I'm going to let you keep your notes because I want you to digest it. Does everybody got me on that? Because guess what's going to happen when you come in tomorrow morning? We got a quiz. We got a quiz. Now, yes, I am going to take your notes, but you're going to have a quiz. Is that right clear there? Now, you want to hear the good news about the quiz? It should be the easiest quiz of your life. If, and this will be a big if, if you have been paying attention today and even at a 50% level. Is that right? Got me on that? Is that right? Hear me on that? You are not supposed to fail tomorrow's quiz. When I say you're going to have to try to fail it, you're going to have to really try, like really, really, really try to fail this quiz. So make sure you're here on time and make sure you guys are ready to go. But let's go ahead and talk about, um, um, what did I just say? The island, immigration. So let's first look at um, Ellis Island. Quick video, look at Ellis Island. And then the next thing we're going to do is Angel Island. We're done. Okay, y'all? All right, let's go. An estimated 40% of Americans are descendants of immigrants that pass through Ellis Island. That's a lot of Americans. The first Ellis Island immigration station opened on January 1st, 1892 in New York Morning. Harbor to manage the increasing okay. number of migrants coming to America. In that first you, year, a record number of nearly 450,000 people passed through to enter the United States. By the time Ellis Island closed in 1954, that number had reached 12 million, although most of those people arrived by 1924. Migrants fleeing poverty and persecution or just looking to start a new life traveled by private steamship from Eastern and Southern Europe. Voyages could take one to two weeks. Ships divided passengers by wealth and class. First and second class passengers slept in staterooms and cabins while everyone else stayed in the space at the bottom of the ship called the steerage. Steerage passengers paid around thirty dollars per ticket, but steamship companies would sell as many tickets as they could. First and second class passengers paid even more. Because of this, steerage was often overcrowded and unsanitary, with shared sleeping compartments and no privacy. But hopeful immigrants stuck it out, believing it would be worth it for a chance to live in the United States. When ships finally arrived in New York Harbor, health officers boarded and looked for signs of disease before anyone was allowed to disembark. Healthy first and second class passengers were processed on the spot and allowed to enter the United States without setting foot on Ellis Island. Everyone else waited, sometimes for days, for small ferries to take them to the immigration station for processing. Migrants walked down the gangplank with all of their belongings and dropped their bags in the baggage room on the ground floor. They then continued up a winding staircase to the registry room which was upstairs for a reason. Doctors stood on the second floor and watched each person climb the stairs for signs of health problems. The registry room, nearly 20,000 square feet with 56 foot tall vaulted ceilings, was nicknamed the Great Hall for its size. It was here that most migrants' fate would be decided. The first step to entry was a six second physical exam by a uniformed doctor. Anyone considered a risk to public health was marked on a piece of chalk and taken out of the line to be examined further. Marks were given for everything from signs of mental illness to trachoma, a contagious eye infection that could eventually blind up to three quarters of those infected. Those who cleared the medical exam went on to a legal inspection. Passengers were checked against a manifest from the ship they arrived on and asked 29 identifying questions, often with the help of an interpreter. If their answers didn't match the information on the manifest, things like their name, occupation, and country of origin, they could be detained. The legal interviews could take as little as two minutes, and the vast majority of people passed through with ease and were allowed to enter the country after being issued landing cards with their name, often misspelled, and destination. 
For others, the stay on Ellis Island was considerably longer. The few who were detained for either medical or legal reasons could be on the island overnight or for months. Once their records were finally reviewed, they would either be admitted to the U.S. or sent back to the country they came from, free of charge. But only 2% of the 12 million immigrants processed at Ellis Island were deported in this way. After inspection, everyone continued down a staircase with three aisles. Those being detained walked down the center aisle, those entering New York City or headed north walked down the left, and those traveling west or south walked down the right. At the bottom was a post office, a rail ticket office, and a place to change money. For some, family waiting to greet them, and for all, a new life in America. But was it easy getting to the United States? Did y'all know this though? It, it was a lot getting into the United States. Now, and this is only from the Europeans' perspective. If I got me on that? All right. Angel Island. So a Ellis Island was where? What was Ellis Island at? New York. Is that right? Got me on that? Is that right? Follow me. And so that means you have all your European immigrants coming in through Angel a Ellis Island. Angel Island was on the West Coast in San Francisco Bay. So that's where you have all your Asian immigrants coming in. Is that right? Got me on that? They were not treated exactly the same either. Okay. Um, we're going to go ahead and watch this to the bell rings. Angel Island, nicknamed the Guardian of the Western Gate, home to the entryway for immigrants coming to America in hopes of a better life. Why do immigrants come to the United States, y'all? Hopes for a better for opportunity, for hopes for a better life, right? That's their goal. But not everybody was able to get in. Is that right clear there? Make sure that you add Angel Island to your notes. But we're good right there, okay, everybody? All right, give yourselves a round of applause for all your hard work. All right, and what we got tomorrow, y'all? A quiz, and what am I picking up? The Cornell notes.